financial analysis techniques. On this slide, we look at a time series or trend analysis. And within the context of time series, you need to understand the distinction between a vertical common sized balance sheet and a horizontal common sized balance sheet. <clears throat> the top part of the screen shows a vertical common sized balance sheet. With a vertical common sized balance sheet, we simply take every item on the balance sheet and show the item as a percentage of total assets. The idea here is to highlight the composition of the balance sheet. So for example, for a given company between 2011 and 2012, what is changing? If you simply look at the dollar amount from 10 million to 12 million, that is going up. But if you look at the percentage number, cash is 0.3% of total assets in 2011 and 0.3% of total assets in 2012. So the composition of cash as a percentage of total assets is not changing. On the other hand, if you look at accounts receivable, there the number goes up in absolute terms from 200 to 250, but the vertical common size balance sheet shows you that in percentage terms, the number is increasing from 5.8% to 7.3%. So that is potentially an issue that needs to be looked into. Now let's also look at the horizontal common size balance sheet at the bottom. This structure or this sort of depiction highlights structural changes in a business. And what we do with a horizontal common sized balance sheet is take each balance sheet item and in the base year or base period, we set the item equal to one. Cash, for example, was set to one in period one. Then in period two, cash came down by 20%, down to 0.8. Marketable security stayed the same. Accounts receivable went up by 30%. So notice that this is showing you how the structure of the business is changing. Similarly, on the asset, on the liability and equity side, for example, you will see how the debt is changing and how the equity is changing relative to the original period. Next, we look at cross-sectional analysis. With cross-sectional analysis, you are comparing companies at the same point in time. So let's say you're comparing company A with company B, and you can see that in terms of cash, they both have the same amount of cash relative to total assets. In terms of accounts receivable, company B has a higher percentage of accounts receivable relative to total assets. So the point here is that with cross-sectional analysis, we compare different companies at the same point in time. With time series or trend analysis, we look at what's happening to a particular company over a period of time. Ratio analysis. This is extremely important. We have ratios at the end of the earlier readings and then lots of ratios consolidated over here. These are the broad categories of ratios. Activity ratios measure the efficiency of a company. In an activity ratio, the numerator is going to be something from the income statement. The denominator is going to be a number from the balance sheet. So an example of an activity ratio is revenue divided by assets. Then liquidity ratios tell us about a company's ability to meet short-term obligations Solvency ratios tell us about a company's ability to meet long-term debt obligations. Profitability ratios tell us about the profitability of a company. Valuation ratios tell us about the quantity of <clears throat> the quantity of an asset or flow per share. I'll give you a small trick for remembering the ratios. The first thing to focus on is the name of the ratio. And the name of the ratio will tell you which balance sheet item is part of that ratio. If you have a balance sheet item, so for example, you have an asset turnover ratio, then obviously you are going to have uh, 
the assets as part of the ratio and remember the balance sheet item is going to be in the denominator so asset turnover ratio the balance sheet item is always going to be in the denominator the income statement item will be in the numerator so you need to find the income statement item that corresponds to assets so from assets you generate revenue so the asset turnover ratio would be revenue divided by assets as a general point with ratios you need to interpret them in the context of the goals and strategy of the company you need to compare with industry standards and you also need to be aware of the economic conditions so let's look at activity ratios and i'll highlight the fact that the discussion on how to remember is relevant so inventory turnover without even looking at this you remember the rules so inventory turnover this means that obviously there's going to be inventory inventory is a balance sheet item so that is going to be in the denominator what is the income statement item that corresponds to inventory it's the cost of goods sold because you sell inventory and the cost of inventory is depicted as cost of goods sold this particular ratio the inventory turnover tells us how many times per period the entire inventory was sold so if for a given year the inventory turnover is 5 that means that in a given year the entire inventory was sold approximately 5 times then you will see something like days of inventory on hand this is calculated as the number of days in a period so if the period is a year then the numerator is 365 divided by the inventory turnover that we just calculated if the inventory turnover is high then the days of inventory on hand will be low days of inventory on hand gives you a sense for how many days of inventory are kept on hand or kept or kept at the company on average receivables turnover now again use the same method to come up with the formula so receivables turnover obviously accounts receivables on the in the denominator and typically if possible you try to use the average number whenever you have balance sheet numbers try to figure out the average for the year use that as the denominator what is it that results in accounts receivables it is revenue so you have revenue in the numerator sometimes you will see revenue sometimes you might see credit sales so just be careful about what's being presented and when you are comparing companies you make sure that you use the same exact formula so if you are using credit sales over accounts receivable for one company use the same thing for the other company days of sales outstanding again this is 365 divided by receivables turnover payables turnover would be purchases divided by average payables now payables the corresponding item is purchases but you might not see purchases on the balance sheet or income statement so what do you do how do you come up with purchases one proxy is to look at cost of goods sold then to be a little more accurate you can look at cost of goods sold and the change in inventory number of days of payables would be 365 divided by the payables turnover working capital turnover so this would be revenue divided by average working capital and fixed asset turnover would be revenue divided by average fixed assets then we have liquidity ratios that we've seen before we've talked about the current ratio that's current assets over current liabilities quick ratio is cash plus short term marketable securities plus receivables over current liabilities the cash ratio is cash plus short term marketable investments divided by current liabilities the defensive interval ratios so cash plus short term marketable investments plus receivables and the denominator is daily cash expenditures the cash conversion cycle or the net operating cycle is a measure of how long it takes between spending cash and receiving cash so days of inventory on hand plus days of sales outstanding minus number of days of payables if you are asked to calculate the operating cycle then the operating cycle is days of inventory on hand plus days of sales outstanding 
solvency ratios these tell us about a company's ability to meet longer term obligations within solvency ratios there are two categories the first category is shown here so debt over assets debt to capital debt to equity and financial leverage in terms of debt to assets so all these ratios debt wherever debt is in the numerator a low ratio means that it is safer so you want low levels of debt with financial leverage ratio again low means safer high means that the company is more leveraged has taken on more debt solvency ratio so interest coverage is ebit or operating income divided by interest payments and then fixed charge coverage this is ebit plus lease payments divided by interest payments plus lease payments the logic here is that you also want to measure a company's ability to pay lease payments just like interest payments lease payments are also obligations so ebit is before interest you want to come up with a measure that is the amount of cash generated before making lease payments but ebit is calculated after making lease payments so you want to add back the lease payments and then in the denominator you have the total commitment the total amount of money that you need to pay which is interest payments and lease payments and with these ratios a high number is good so high means that your earnings is high relative to the amount of interest or lease payments that you need to make profitability ratios are fairly straightforward gross profit margin is gross profit over revenue operating profit margin is operating profit over revenue pre tax margin is earnings before tax over revenue and net profit margin is net income over revenue return on assets so operating roa is operating income over average total assets return on assets is net income over average total assets remember whenever you see the term return then the numerator is net income return on total capital actually let me rephrase that not always so when we talk about return on total capital since we are talking about both debt and equity here the numerator also needs to correspond to debt and equity so ebit is the money from which you pay debt holders as well as equity holders so when you talk about return on total capital then you take ebit in the numerator and short term long term debt and equity in the denominator roe is extremely important this is net income over average total equity and return on common equity would be net income minus preferred dividend divided by average common equity next we deal with dupont analysis so what dupont analysis helps us do is decompose the various components of net income so what dupont analysis allows us to do is decompose the various components of the return on equity so return on equity is net income over equity this can be shown as equal to return on assets which is net income over assets multiplied by financial leverage which is assets, assets over equity. equity so notice the a and the a would cancel out and you are left with the same then the <coughs> return on assets can further be written as net profit margin into total assets so net profit margin is net income divided by sales into total asset turnover which is sales over assets so look this is net income over assets and then the financial leverage just flows through so that is assets over equity here the sales and sales cancel out assets assets cancel out and you would again be left with net income over equity so you might have a situation where net income over equity is high and when you do this decomposition you might realize that it's high because of high leverage ideally you would want a high net income over equity because of either a high profit margin or sales over assets is a measure of how productive the company is 
then net income over sales can be broken into tax burden, into interest burden, into EBIT margin. In this crash course, I will leave this out, but if you have time, then in the regular lecture, you can see that this can be further decomposed. This can show up, but the probability is low. Generally, I've seen questions that go up to three levels.